This video is brought to you by our amazing supporters over at Patreon. Hey everyone, it's Ben from Board to Bits. To take our generator from our idea of what a building should be to something we can implement in code, we need to formally document our generation process, and we're going to do that with a grammar. A grammar, or more specifically a Bacchus Noor form grammar, or BNF grammar, is a set of rules that our program will follow. Each rule transforms an element in our generated object into one or more other elements. These elements are represented by symbols, and the rules are called production rules, because the symbol on the left produces the symbol or symbols on the right. Symbols can be defined as terminals or non-terminals. The easiest way to differentiate terminals and non-terminals is that for a non-terminal, some rule exists in the grammar that can transform that non-terminal into something else. A terminal has no such rule, and so will never change again. Non-terminals are generally used in two situations. First, if that element can be further specified, and second, if that element contains subparts within it. We'll be flagging non-terminals with angle brackets in our written grammar so that we can identify them more easily. Alternatively, you can put your terminals in quotes to differentiate them. The rules of a grammar serve as a way to ensure that each step being taken as we generate our item is a step that makes sense. If we do something that doesn't make sense, then our item will no longer match any of the grammar rules and we'll know something is wrong. In procedural generation, we can take a top-down approach, starting with the end item and using the rules to configure the elements within the object. We can also use a bottom-up approach, generate a random item, and then check that its elements follow the rules. For an example, let's think about a dungeon generator. Here's a simple grammar we could use. The first rule is our starting rule. We are always creating a dungeon, so we start there. The first element in the dungeon is always the entrance room, and that never changes or has additional contents, so it is a terminal. The next element and its associated rule is a little weird, but it's a big part of how grammars work, so let's dive into it. We have a specific non-terminal to define rooms plural. The rule for rooms can produce a single room, or a single room and another room's element. That rooms on the right isn't the same as the rooms on the left. Rather, you could think of it as the room on the left with one room removed. This is kind of a weird syntax, but what it allows us to do is to establish a variable with one or more of an item. For example, rooms could just produce room, giving us a section with one room, or it could produce room rooms, and that second rooms could then produce room, so we have two rooms in the dungeon. And we can repeat this as much as we want. If you're familiar with regular expressions, this is like using the asterisk to indicate one or more of an element. The room can then be specified to have a particular theme or trap in it, so we have another rule to convert the room into that specific type. Those specific types are the terminals. We won't customize them any further. The boss room and treasure room are both collections of subparts. They both need a room. The boss could have any type of room. The treasure room will always be empty. And they also contain their respective resident element, the boss or the treasure, which both are further specified. This is a fairly simple grammar, but it gives us a lot of flexibility in what we want to create, mixing and matching bosses, treasures, and varying numbers and styles of rooms. It's important to note that this grammar is just an outline of what we'll be implementing. It doesn't give us any direction in terms of how to program our generator, what algorithms to use, etc. But it serves as a good set of guidelines we can use to ensure that the code we write will generate the types of objects that we want. Another shortcoming of BNF grammars, and most grammars, is that they are context insensitive. This means that one symbol in the grammar is unaware of any of its neighbors. For example, we might not want a dungeon with two consecutive rooms of the same type. Unfortunately, with just the grammar, we have no real way to enforce this. Every room can perfectly legally become any type of room, so it is very possible to create two consecutive rooms of the same type. To solve issues like this, we need to apply additional metadata for our generation which we'll have to make note of and handle directly in our implementation. We also cannot easily restrict a rule to a number of iterations with the one or more approach. We could set limits with explicit rooms. For example, if we only wanted one to three rooms, we could say that the rooms element equals room or room room or room room room, but at a certain point this becomes unwieldy. So again, we can address this in our metadata and implementation. I'll reiterate. Think of a grammar as an outline rather than a program. Now, 
Let's create our building grammar from the general idea of our building. Because we're using a subtractive generation, we'll start with a whole building and divide it into elements from there. It would seem reasonable to have our first step to be to break our building into a roof, walls, and floor. However, this limits us in a big way. Because the roof doesn't know the context of the rest of the building, this would limit us to one type and possibly one height of roof across the whole building. And I want a little more variety in our buildings. Instead, what we'll do is first break the building into one or more wings. Each wing can be a different number of stories tall, which we'll handle with a stories and story element. Each wing can then also have its own roof style, such as a spire-like point, a peak, a simple slope, or a completely flat roof. And these specific roof styles will be terminals. Again, if we want to establish things like each wing must be a different height, or specify roof types based on the surrounding wings, we'll have to handle those in implementation. For the purposes of this generator, I'm not worrying about constructing the inside of the buildings. So this each story can simply be a combination of a floor, terminal symbol, and some number of walls, specifically enough walls to outline the wing. Those walls can either be empty, have a door, or have a window. These are the wall terminals. Here, we may want to note that doors should only appear on the first floor. Again, this is a metadata question. So our final grammar looks something like this. If we were going to go the next step to generating individual rooms within the building, this would be an excellent opportunity for a recursive approach. In the same way that we'll break down our building into wings, each story can be broken down into rooms, which would then have their own walls. Recognizing the similar process there can help us reuse our code within the generation process, saving us some time. This isn't in the scope of this series, but worth thinking about if you're generating the inside of the building as well. With our grammar in place, we can start to implement the generator for our building, and we'll do that in our next video. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, and you can always subscribe to the channel to get alerts when new videos release. Also, consider backing on Patreon, where you can get exclusive project files and early updates. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.